Hello, Jean. Hey, Cliff. How's it going? Good. Hello, happy song lovers. We hope that you're doing well. Yes. We're coming at you live, well, live right now, uh -huh. from the nave. Yay. Yay. And it's in the morning. Yay. <laughs> so you've got some sun in the windows back there. That's right. nice. Right. That'll be pretty. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So we got a bunch of stuff today. We're continuing on with our theme of looking at the hymns that pertain to the lectionary. Yeah. So this week is... Um, is the shepherds? This is no. No, that, this is the it'll next. It'll be week. the fifth, fifth yes. Easter. So this is five Easter. So yeah. And if I think about it, I'll put the lectionary into the <laughs> oh, into the ahead. notes too. That would be nice if we're talking about the eh, lectionary. Whatever. <laughs> but these hymns were uh, were recommended as uh, hymns to sing for this for that coming Sunday. So great. Okay. So the first one um, is hymn number one seventy eight, and that's going to be in your. Um, hymnal 82 hymnal and this is one that I I have a backstory to I'll tell you first about the hymn itself and then I'll tell you my personal story this is Alleluia Alleluia give thanks to the risen Lord written by Donald Fischel who was born in Michigan in 1950 flautist and composer he lives in Nashville now and he plays concert and teaches flute so this hymn was composed in the summer of 1971 when he was living at the guest house of the Word of God, a Roman Catholic community in Ann Arbor. He was praying and singing spontaneously and just sang the song almost as it is today. So it's his words and it's his music. Yeah. And it's called Alleluia is the tune, appropriately. Yeah. So that's what it is. But my story to this, and it kind of holds a special part in my heart is that this was always one of the communion hymns during Easter Sunday morning. Mm -hmm. And after all the hoopla, uh, the excitement of Easter with the brass going and the choir singing and everybody hallelujah, it was kind of a relaxing time for the choir and I was in a church where the choir sat up front, not in the gallery. So we would, this was one of the hymns that we had to sing. I think we sang like three or four because there were so many communicants. But this was one of the ones that was sung, and it was kind of like a quiet time, and we got to check out everybody's Easter outfits. <laughs> nice, nice. Sort of just, just relax while things were going on. So that, that's, my, that's my remembrance and what I associate with this hymn. It's a lovely little hymn. Mm -hmm. uh, what verse is it? Um, golly, golly, golly. Shall we do one, two, and four? Let's do one, two, and four. Okay. Jesus. 
our second hymn, we're going to go straight from the Green Book, Wonder, Love, and Praise, number 765. This is O Blessed Spring. This is a new text, new as in 1993, which I guess for most hymnals is considered, you know, cutting edge. Well, you're cutting edge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So this is by Susan Palo Sherwin. She was born in 1953. She's an American, born in Ohio. She went to Wittenberg University. I guess they say Wittenberg. No, I think they say Wittenberg. But in I Springfield. Saw that. She's got a bachelor's with emphasis in voice. Studied in Berlin, later studied in Chicago. She's got a degree in spirituality, ritual, and the arts. Heavens. How, how do you get a degree in spirituality? I don't know, or ritual. No, for she that found matter. the place. Hmm. She's a poet, quite a prolific poet, and a hymn writer, and she is married to the original wild man organist, <laughs> David Sherwin. I know David, he is a wild man organist. Wild guy, huh? So this text I really like. This is uh, images of being grafted into the true vine that's based on John 15, and it's set in the larger context of the four seasons as a metaphor for human life. Mm -hmm. So, um, the second verse, through summer heat of youthful years, uncertain faith, rebellious tears. Third, when autumn cools and youth is cold, when limbs are heavy, harvest full. Fourth, as winter comes, as winter must, we breathe our last, return to dust. It's really, really beautiful, really it beautiful is. writing. Yeah. She intended it as a hymn for baptisms that spoke of that sacrament as a lifelong journey instead of a one-time event. That's very interesting. Yeah. yeah, you don't think of that as as a theme to bring into baptism, but there's a lot of truth to it. But we really should. Mm -hmm. I mean, our we baptismal should. covenant, as many times as we hear that through the year. Exactly. It, it ought to be a lifelong commitment. And this, I thought, was really interesting. It's based on a bronze sculpture called Life Tree. And oh. this is in her own home church in Minneapolis. How about that? I found a picture of it, which um, I may include in the notes. Yeah. But it's, it's, it's really interesting. Wow. The tune is by a guy named Robert Buckley Farley, who's also an American, born in California, studied at Concordia College in Nebraska, also Concordia Seminary and Christ Seminary Seminex in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. He served as a musician in Missouri and a pastor in Minnesota. Oh, yeah, since 81, he's been with Augsburg Fortress Publishers, as well as with Christ Church Lutheran in Minneapolis as an associate pastor and a musician. And uh, you actually heard some work of Farley, uh, if you listen to The Passion Tide, that Dan and Luana sang his uh, solemn reproaches of the cross. Oh, yes. Very yes. much jazz influence, but, but very powerful. So apparently, Farley and Sherwin were attending a conference together, and Farley asked her if she had any new texts which had no tunes. Mm. And she <laughs> this, said, I just happen to have this one. <laughs> and this one was supposed to be sung to O Whaley Whaley, which we know as oh, yeah. The Wanderer's Wife. Farley's imagination, and he wrote this, this tune, and is nice. named for his mother. How about that? Yeah. Wow. So what verses, well, you can read all the verses on your uh, PDF. What verses should we sing? Well, I, I think definitely one and five, and I don't know which one in the middle we should do. Maybe, <clears throat> should we do the autumn, the summer, the autumn, the winter? Five. Let's do oh, let's do one, three, and five. So one, we'll do spring, five. Okay. autumn, and, and Christ the vine. Sounds good. Good.
our third hymn for today, we're actually going to do two. 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 And it's, they're found in, um, in, in the hymnal 82, 448, and it's companion tune, 449. Oh love, how deep, how broad, how high. This is very interesting. This text is found in only one source which uh, is a 15th century manuscript, and it's actually used as a nativity hymn. Isn't that interesting? That's very interesting, yeah. Um, so the first tune, 448, is called Deus Tuorum Militum. It dates from the late 18th century, and it uh, might be called a French church melody. Um, originally, it was associated with the Gregorian text for which it is named. Now our second tune uh, is also very interesting, Deo Gracias, early 15th century, and was thought to have been written in commemoration of King Henry V's victory over the French at the Battle of Agincourt in 1415. And the original text was, Deo Gracias Angela Rede Pro Victoria. Our king went forth to Normandy with grace and might of chivalry, their God for him wrought marvelously, wherefore England may call and cry, Deo gracias. How cool is that? <laughs> yeah. So, um, this tune also has known by other names. It's known by Agincourt, Agincourt Hymn, the Agincourt Carol, and the Agincourt Song, all because of the battle yeah. where it took place yeah. in 1415 where I have no idea where that is in France, but somewhere in France, probably Somebody in knows. Normandy. Because uh, he says his king, the king went forth to Normandy. To Normandy, yeah. Anyway. So, um, there's Eric Routley, who we've talked about before, who is a, a well-known commentator on hymns mm -hmm. uh, in, in general, says he likes to sing this hymn to Deo Gracias, the first tune, for verses one to four. So, I'm sorry, the second tune, verses 1 to 4, 5 to Deus Tuorum, which is the first tune, to highlight the resurrection. And because then go back. that's that verse, because for us he rose from death again. Yes, and it goes up. And yeah, and the, the tune. The tune. Goes up. Yeah, so. And then back to the Deo Gracias for the sixth. Mm -hmm. So we're going to do something even more crazy which may take 20 times to record, but we're going to do it. <laughs> we're going to do verses 1, 2, and 5 with 4, 4, 8 as the tune, and 3, 4, and 6 with 4, 4, 9. So, pray for us. <laughs> Oh. 
one shot. It's a one shot. And for one of my absolute favorite hymns, one of 300. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> We're at uh, hymnal 1982, or 513, like the murmur of the dove's song. This is Carl Daw, and if you've been in song lovers at all, you've seen Carl Daw. Uh, born in Louisville, educated at Rice University, the University of Virginia, and the University of the South. Professor of English at the College of William and Mary. That's in Staten, isn't it? It's, yes, yeah, I think so. so he knows yeah. Jen's church, that's yeah. cool. That's a little aside there. Mm -hmm. um, he was ordained a priest in 1982, and he began his hymn writing life when appointed to the text committee in the preparation for this very hymnal. Wow. Um, he was asked by the standing committee of the Episcopal Church for the 1982 hymnal to write a text for the tune Bridegroom, which is this tune. Mm -hmm. The committee recognized the success of certain texts could be attributed to an attractive tune. I could have told them that. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you what. Yeah, that was a light bulb going off in somebody's head. Indeed, and how did it take so long? <laughs> Why are there so many stinkers in it? Exactly. So Daw apparently played this tune on a variety of instruments to discover what he calls its intrinsic tone and message, and he determined that the last phrase expressed a prayer for the coming of the Spirit. Interesting. So he wrote a prayer to the Holy Spirit, and it's based on Isaiah uh, 38 and also 59. You can read the quotes there. Mm -hmm. uh, both passages use moaning dove as images of praying in distress. And the tune is by a guy named Peter Cutts, born in Birmingham, England, sang bass in the Birmingham Cathedral Choir. How about that? Became organist of the St. James Presby Church in Huddersfield, Yorkshire, appointed to the music staff of Breton Hall College of Higher Education in Wakefield, Yorkshire, and then appointed to the director of music, St. John's Methodist Church in Massachusetts. So wow. he, he skipped the pond. Yes, he did. He began writing hymn tunes in 1955, including several with Brian Wren. We've seen Brian Wren before, too. Mm -hmm. Love his texts, too. Um, and Routley, we just talked about Eric Routley. Yeah. And you got to know about Routley, that when Routley has an opinion, he is never shy of expressing his opinion. Yeah. I read a book about church music, 20th century church music, and boy, are there opinions in there. Yeah. <laughs> But this I thought was very good, says Routley, Cuts could well be the most creative composer to come out of English congregationalism. That is high praise. From Routley, From absolutely. Routley. Mm -hmm. And he wrote this tune for As the Bridegroom to His Chosen, first published in 1969. He composed the tune at Eric Routley's grand piano. How about that? <laughs> for a projected Coventry Cathedral hymn book that never happened. Wow. But what a beautiful tune. It is a beautiful tune. So Routley and Cuts must have been buds. They must have been buds. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So uh, we'll do the whole thing. We'll do the whole thing.
Gene, that was fun. That was fun. Thanks for singing. Uh, thank you for, for playing. <laughs> it's my job. <laughs> and thank you for being here with us. Um, next week, look forward to another one based on the lectionary for, I guess that'll be 6 Easter. 6 Easter, yes. Cool. And we hope that you're healthy and happy and well and make sure that you're all getting those vaccinations. Yes, yes, yes. Mm -hmm. it's, a, it's a minor inconvenience to prevent a horrible disease. Indeed. Peace, everyone.